Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the Fourth Trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth Trimester Care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. Hi, this is Sarah Trott at the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'll be recording solo today with a guest without Esther Gallagher, my co-host, who is dearly missed, but uh, helping out a postpartum client today. So she will join us in future episodes. In the meantime, I wanted to remind all of our listeners that we have a website, which is fourthtrimesterpodcast.com. And we have a Facebook page, so you can search for Fourth Trimester Podcast on Facebook or link through our website to that group um, and join us there and get awesome content. We also have a Patreon page where you can go and sponsor our program for even a dollar, which would be hugely appreciated if you're willing to do that. And I'm so excited today because I'm speaking to someone who specializes in an area that we haven't really covered on the show to date. Her name is Ayelet Marinovich, and she is a pediatric speech language pathologist. She's a parent educator, a singer, and she's a mother based in the San Francisco Bay Area. So she's also the creator of something called Strength in Words, and we're going to talk about that today. Strength in Words has a mission to promote caregiver and baby interaction and support parent education through music, play, sensory experiences, and language-rich environments. Her current passions include spending time with her family and creating a community of support for families of young children with infants and toddlers of all developmental levels. And you can learn more about her on strengthinwords.com. So welcome, Ayelet. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's great to be here. Yeah. Thanks so much again for joining us to be on our program. So you have a really interesting story about (laughs) your own motherhood and postpartum experience. (laughs) We'd love to hear about that if you'd like to share it with us. I would love to. Yeah. So it's kind of a roundabout journey as (laughs) as most parenthood journeys are. But basically when I was 10 weeks pregnant with my first son who was born in 2014, my husband and I uh, made our way over to the UK and I spent much of my pregnancy there in London which of course was, you know, I was newly pregnant. Uh, We were fairly newly married and we were in a brand new place. I had no support system. I didn't know anything about the healthcare system, except that there were lots of midwives around. And, you know, there was a great show called Call the Midwife, (laughs) which I love to this day. (laughs) And and, uh, so I got to spend a lot of time figuring that out. And I was, you know, waiting for my uh, speech and language pathology license to transfer over to the UK. So I wasn't working at the time. So I had this amazing sort of time to just be pregnant and enjoy that. And I got to do lots of amazing prenatal yoga. And that was wonderful. And I met a lot of wonderful other uh, soon to be first time mommies during that time. And Let's see. So I had a very uh, non-dis- nondescript, I had a very normal <laughs> pregnancy <laughs> and went into labor and everything progressed uh, very naturally and smoothly. We had hired a doula because we were very excited about having somebody who sort of knew the system and, um, you know, could really advocate for us in, in all the right ways and, and just lead us through that, that unfamiliar territory. Uh, both as brand new soon to be parents and as people who had never, you know, had a baby given birth before. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was um, a a pretty uh, straightforward labor until 
uh, we just, he just got stuck. Um, I pushed and pushed. I had about five hours. They let me push. <laughs> they let me push <laughs> for a long time before it was sort of like, yeah, this is just, I was exhausted. This wasn't going to happen. So I, I hobbled over <laughs> to labor and delivery from the in hospital birth center and had some assistance and he was born. So, uh, but the beauty of the UK system is that in addition to it just being sort of natural birth is much more normal. <laughs> um, and, and the way that people can do birth in the UK is basically you can do whatever you want. You can have a national healthcare system, you know, sponsored or funded home birth, or you can have a plan C-section and pay for it or, or anything in between. So that sort of beauty of all of those options was quite impressive. Uh, but basically, when when we went home, there is there are midwives, community midwives, who come to your home after you've returned from the hospital, assuming you've had a hospital birth, and you get this wonderful postpartum care for the first you know week or so. Um, a midwife comes to your home every few days, makes sure you know does all the well baby checks in home, and all the you know, newborn screening type things, and. Uh, and you never have to leave, which was amazing, especially because I had had, you know, a pretty rough go of it in the end. Mm -hmm. So that was great. <laughs> and <Yeah>. then. <laughs> and the doula you hired was yeah. for the birth and not for yeah. the postpartum care. Not for the postpartum, but she did do several postpartum visits and, oh, you know. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was, she was fantastic. And she was also like an amazing, she provided me with wonderful sort of just time to get to know her and be with her during my pregnancy in, as in addition to just the birth. So yeah, that was a phenomenal experience. And I'm still in touch with her four years later oh, uh, and across an ocean. So, um, so that was great. And then, uh, and then I had this, you know, incredible sort of community of other new moms that we had created uh, following our, our prenatal yoga class. And I started leading these, sort of in home, something between like a music class and a developmental group and just a real mommy and me. But it wasn't just moms, it was moms, dads, grandparents, nannies, anybody, and the tiny baby, it, you know, in the very early days, it was mostly moms. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we got this great chance to just sort of sit and be together and support each other and watch our babies and observe our babies and observe each other with each other's babies, you know, it was just this very one, amazing sort of chance to synthesize everything that we were going through. <laughs> and that, that, you know, connect with this new identity of being parents, this, this connect also with our babies and, and connect with a beautiful community of support. So that was, very special. And that was sort of when strength in words, which is what I continued to work on was born. That was how it was born. Uh, so my husband and I and my son were in the UK for the first two years of my son's life. And then uh, he started a new job in Berlin. So we moved to Germany. Uh, and I had started a podcast, the strength and words podcast by then. And I was sort of plugging away at that, trying to, you know, reach more people and, and spread this, you know, great information and, and ideas to connect with your baby and stuff like that. And that was, you know, very rewarding. Um, and I would basically do it while my son napped as I think Sarah, you are quite a familiar, familiar with that. It's what I'm doing literally right now. So yes, <laughs> me too with my second. Yeah. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was, that was great. And let's see. And then I, I fell pregnant as we, as one says in the UK, I fell pregnant in, um, <laughs> in, uh, in Berlin with my second and I spent the first 30 weeks of my second pregnancy in Germany. So I literally got like the tour de maternity and birth options. <laughs> and then we yes. moved back to the to the US to California at 30 weeks. Um, and I had oh. my second here in California. <laughs> and I had decided be, based on my first experience, mostly based on that, I wanted... 
I wanted to have all the options open to me here. And what that ended up looking like was we, we hired a, 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 excuse me, a midwife to, and we had a planned home birth. And I was just like, you know what? I don't care if we transferred to the hospital. That's totally fine with me. (laughs) I just want to be able to do what I want to do. And I want someone to do the postpartum care in my house. Like that, honestly, for me, that was what I was paying for. (laughs) Just all of the options and the postpartum care. Like, oh, and what ended up happening (laughs) was that's basically what it paid for. Because, (laughs) I mean, you know, a midwife is much more than just helping you through a birth, as we all know. But um, <laughs> I had, I ended up having a precipitous labor and it was literally two and a half hours from very start to very finish. And my midwife was on the phone as my husband got the baby and she arrived a few minutes after the afterbirth. So oh, wow. <laughs> it was amazing, <laughs> but so yeah, it was totally insane. Uh, but it was, it was fine. Uh, luckily everything went, you know, beautifully and very smoothly. And we ordered Vietnamese food and went to bed. (laughs) It's amazing. (laughs) And my older son also, like, I love this. Uh, he, (laughs) we, you know, because things happen so quickly, he happened to wake up from a nap about half, halfway through. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And my husband was like, okay, we're putting on, you know, something, some show so he can just be yes. while I can take care of you, figure out what's going on. And, um, and then I think the baby, literally like the baby was born. And then my son was like, mama. Oh. <laughs> and we were like, Oh my God, <laughs> the child. Right. Like, and we were like, here, come in, come in. Your baby brother's here. And he oh. literally came in, looked at my tiny newborn and was like, Oh, the baby's on the outside. I'm going to go oh. get him a toy. Oh. <laughs> and then came back with like, you know, some little baby toy that I had just shown him recently. Like, oh, this is something that a baby might play with. <laughs> and then oh. probably disappeared again, right? It was like, oh, what well, could be more normal than the, that baby who was inside my mommy's belly is now on the outside. <laughs> Great. Cool. Here, here, entertain him. I'm going to go entertain myself. Like, so that what was a awesome. wonderful start to their brotherhood relationship. <laughs> so cute. Yeah. Caring after his little brother from the very first moment. Uh, yes. And um, I mean, we should probably say that, of course, it's not always that beautiful, but it was a wonderful start. <laughs> That's not the right tone. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. I love that. Oh, my goodness. So you've been around the world. <laughs> pregnant and birthing yeah um, us and europe and had a, a range of experiences i wish esther was here because i think she would really jump all over the the comparisons to other countries yeah. we talk about that often um it, it tends to come up um, well maybe we i i'll come back sometime and we can do that <laughs> yeah I, I know she would love that and just in particular like hearing you say have, having had the the postpartum in-house care the yeah. first time is just something that was Ugh kind of a given, I guess, I guess. Exactly. So yeah. That was a given. Yeah. You couldn't imagine having Not done having it, it without that. Yeah. yeah. And you went out of your way to make sure that that happened yeah. here in, you know, in California. Um, and I think what's more common, especially for, for women in, in the United States is to, that because that it isn't a given to have someone come to your home and check on you no. between the day you go home and like six weeks no. where you're meant to go somewhere to your uncomfortably. Yeah. Right. I can yeah. imagine like yeah. walking or, or whatever kind of recovery state you're in. Like women just don't know the difference. And I, no. so I really want to emphasize that to any listeners who, yeah. who think that this is this care, this <laughs> in-home care, some kind of extravagant luxury all around the world. It's not actually. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it makes a huge difference to the care and comfort um, of your whole family, not just the baby. It's not really, I mean, it's really about mom too, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And just to have someone to come into your home, you know, I mean, I think I was in the hospital the first time around. I was in the hospital overnight and then we went home the next evening. So 
you know, my milk hadn't come in yet, but you know, I, I, he was left, he seemed to be latching fine. Everything seemed okay. But, but then like he was a little jaundiced and we were home and just to be able to number one, call the like community midwife local hotline and be like, ah, is this normal? What's happening? And then number two, like, okay, we'll send someone out first thing in the morning. Oh, great. Uh, You know, I mean, I had someone just to, to talk to about, you know, being terrified that my, my breasts were becoming engorged and my baby wasn't, had no interest in feeding because he was so tired or, you know, all of it. And then, you know, I had, I had had to have, um, an episiotomy and I mean, I had someone to just look at my stitches and make sure that everything was okay, which actually it wasn't. And I had to go into the hospital because she noticed that like, I mean, and, and you all of it. Have noticed, right? <laughs> yes, so. exactly. So it could have got my entire postpartum experience the first time around would have been completely different and much more difficult than it already was had I not had that. Mm-hmm. So just you know, I mean, I think it, it's it's amazing when we can have that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So okay, I would love to hear what a pediatric speech language <laughs> pathologist is. <laughs> yeah. So it's a mouthful. Okay. <laughs> Try saying that if you need my services. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, my God. so, uh, well, it can mean uh, really a number of things. But really, what it means is I, of course, the pediatric part means that I work with children. Mm-hmm. Uh, speech and language pathologist is really, um, you know, I think a lot of people know the term speech therapist or language therapist, perhaps more. Uh, But basically, you know, a speech and language pathologist can do many, many different things. Our training is quite, you know, it's a huge spectrum because we deal with speech, language and communication, which really are three different things. And I can speak to that point in a minute. But what I do is, uh, I, I specialize in early communication. So I focus on early intervention. So treating infants and toddlers um, who are speech who are delayed in the acquisition of speech or language or communication. Uh, but since I've uh, become a, a mom. And since my, my creation of strength and words, I also do a huge amount of parent education and they really fall in line with each other. Because of course, when you are working with a child, an infant and to- or a toddler, someone under the age of three, of course, the person or people that you're really, really working with is the grown up <laughs> who is with that person. Mm-hmm. So because, of course, the aim is not just to be the therapist who walks into your door and brings a bunch of magical therapy tools. The aim <laughs> is to actually educate the parent or caregiver about how to support the young child's acquisition of speech and language. So and support communication development. So, um, so with my work with Strength in Words, I work with parents and caregivers and families um, with infants and toddlers of all developmental levels. So whether or not your child is delayed in communication or any other area, this is sort of the basis for early and early development. So, yeah. (laughs) So basically what a speech language pathologist who works with infants and toddlers does is play. (laughs) It's focused play uh, because we know that infants and toddlers learn through sort of a system of through observation, through imitation and, and of course, through interaction. So and that's how they learn not only about communication, but about motor development and cognitive development and social and emotional development. So it all goes hand in hand. Infants and toddlers are very holistic learners, meaning that, you know, if you are, if you think you're, say, working or playing with uh, something around motor development, you're also inherently working on all the other aspects of development, right? Because you're close to that child, you're 
you're supporting that child, you're there for that child, you're assisting that child, you're modeling, you're interacting with, right? So all of these areas, you're maybe supporting a concept, right? That's cognitive development. Maybe you're pointing at something that you're labeling and encouraging your baby to point at something that, well, that's, of course, communication development and a gesture, but it's also fine motor skills and gross motor skills. You're extending an arm, you're isolating a finger. So it all, it all works together in this beautiful system (laughs) of emerging learning. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, definitely. And I think for people who aren't familiar with working like professionals such as yourself, there might be an assumption that, you know, you hear speech therapist or language Mm -hmm. therapist, and it just means the person you work with, if your child has a speech impediment or some kind of, um, you know, a serious delay, yeah, Yeah, something like that. But that's, but it's so much more than that. Yes, (laughs) it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, and so it's, it's thinking about how to work more positively and and encourage, um, encourage certain things, not just uh, correct. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, really the difference between therapy and just play is that there's a focused target. There's a goal in mind, a very specific goal, right? Like we are going to provide a bunch of opportunities for this child to be able to engage in a specific skill in the spectrum of skill development, right? So, um, yeah. And then play, of course, is really just being intentional about what you're doing. Um, I mean, it doesn't always have to be that way. Obviously, play can also be very, you know, we're sitting here and we're, we're just hanging out. (laughs) Um, But yeah, just giving sort of the tools to families to understand those building blocks of learning and also to break it down and realize, or really just remind ourselves what play looks like and can look like, because I think our conception as adults of play is, you know, a game with rules or, with something with an end in mind, right? A plus B equals C. We are linear thinkers in this world, especially I think in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area, right? Mm-hmm. But all over the world, we we lose that as adults. We become goal oriented, and A plus B does not always equal C with a child, with an infant or a toddler. Um, blocks are not just for stacking. Books are not just for reading, and there is a benefit to all of the different things that we can do with those objects. They're just play materials. They're just the, the tool to facilitate an interaction really, or some kind of problem solving or learning. Um, So yeah, it's, it's much more about understanding more about an interaction and about how we can really just support our children very simply because it's not about also having fancy materials, right? You can support your child perfectly well with just common household items that you already have in your home, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. some of my favorites include things like a mirror or uh, a paper roll, uh, or a tissue roll or a tissue box, an empty tissue box or toilet paper for that matter. I mean, gosh, that's fun. (laughs) Um, You know, so it's just a matter of sort of reframing, okay, how can we use this? How can this become a tool for interaction? And how can I support my child through things like musical experiences or early literacy experiences or sensory experiences? How can I use visuals in my environment, you know, pictures uh, in magazines or photos that I've printed in a, in a learning way to enhance learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's so many probably small practical things that we could be doing um, consciously. And I'd love to walk through some examples. So in the Mm -hmm. past we've touched on in other episodes we've talked about. So for example, the importance of eye contact. Sure. And, and I'm sure you have uh, lots of ideas, but how would we support the very early, early, little, little baby um, development, say from, you know, zero to three months and then maybe three to six and then that 
throughout that first year. Yeah. What can, what can moms do or, and parents do and think about? Cause a lot of our listeners are about to have their baby. Yeah. So I love, um, as we know, okay. So I have a lot on my site about this, but one of my favorite things that I like to talk about is this idea of choice making and that tiny, tiny, tiny people can make a choice and you can, you can assume intentionality and create an opportunity to help them, you know, initiate communication even before they're able to do much else. (laughs) I mean, if we think about it, a, a tiny baby at six weeks is already communicating for a few different purposes. One, when they cry by six weeks, assuming we have, you know, let them know that we come (laughs) most of the time that they cry, they are crying intentionally to let us know that they need something. That's pretty amazing. (laughs) And then number two, they're around six weeks also starting to engage in what we call a social smile, right? So before then, you may have a wonderful preview of your baby smiling. Yes, I know it is beautiful and it's adorable, but it is probably just gas or exercising or reflexes of muscles. But by that time, that six month um, mark, that baby is smiling back at you because he or she has figured out that when you smile, that's something he or she can try out. And and then when, when he does it, you get really excited and happy and, and you do it again. And you, that's a social routine. So six weeks, a six week old can't do much for, for himself, <laughs> but that's two specific ways that they're communicating. So, okay. So what can we do specifically with eye contact? Um, so we know that a child under the age, age of about three months, three to four months is seeing only about 12 inches away, right? That, that gap between when you're holding them in your arms to your face, right? Uh, when, imagine if you're breastfeeding or sitting with a bottle, um, you are holding that baby and they're looking into your eyes and that's how far they can see basically. Like that's pretty great nature. (laughs) Um, so So you can, of course, you can do things like use um, high contrast or strong colors uh, when you're holding a baby, something that they can focus on behind you, perhaps, whether that's, you know, a picture frame um, or an image on the wall or whether that's, you know, an actual, you know, fancy black and white, high contrast image that you've invested in, right? It can be anything. It's just something to focus on, right? Or um, we can use things during tummy time for them to look up at or on the side of themselves or while they're laying on their backs, right? Like a mobile is a wonderful thing for them to look at. But if you're talking about eye contact, we move maybe a little bit later in addition to obviously laying down on the floor and looking at your baby and talking to your baby, or maybe going to one side and then the other and encouraging your baby to move based on localizing the sound of your voice. Like that's a wonderful way to, to engage. Um, but once that, um, what's it called more, uh, binocular vision, which emerges usually around the four month mark, uh, which means that, you know, they're able to see a little bit farther away. Um, that is a great time to start really more so introducing additional images or, or having them say, make choices. And one way, um, one example that I give in, um, I think a, a podcast episode that I have is say you are, you've got a puzzle. And you've got some puzzle pieces that are animals and you're singing a song like old MacDonald had a farm. Um, and you are holding up the two puzzle pieces that represent those two animals, right? So you might start with old MacDonald had a farm E-I-E-I-O. and on that farm he had a, and then you pause and you put those two puzzle pieces right in front of your baby and give 
your tiny infant the opportunity to reach, which uh, in addition to being able to see a little bit farther away, they are starting to that motor ability to reach and grasp is starting around three to four months as well. So this is like a really nice thing to do with all these wonderful emerging skills um, is to allow them to either look at one of them, reach toward one of them, and for you to just provide some feedback, like, oh, I see you're looking at the pig. Okay, oh, you looked at the cow. Oh, you're looking at the pig again. Great, let's do the pig. And on that farm, he had a pig, E-I-E-I-O, and then sing about that, right? So you're creating this beautiful cause and effect relationship. You're creating an opportunity for your child to initiate and respond. You're pausing for your child to allow to allow your child to understand that or to start to learn that, oh, maybe it's my turn. So you're also teaching um, and modeling joint attention and turn taking, which of course is a very basic part of a conversation, right? We, I take a turn and then you take a turn and then it goes back and forth. That's a conversation at its most basic form. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a great way to engage in this beautiful, very rich musical. And um, also, I mean, that's early literacy too, right? A symbol for an object and something that's representative of an animal. That's early literacy, right? So you've got this great, very full, very robust activity that you can use to engage with your baby. And that's full of you know, high impact, great stuff that you can do to support your child's development and interact and engage in a very, very easy, very fun way. So (laughs) that's what I would say. (laughs) Hey, fellow parents, can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood? You know, those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones, and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world. But let's be real. Some things are better kept in the family. And your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by, and they might not be that tech savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memories secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions, only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the Family Album Map. The Family Album Map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the app store today, search family album, one word, download the app and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. I love those suggestions. And those are so um, actionable immediately yeah, for anyone exactly. who's thinking about how to interact with their little, little baby. And you mentioned musical, like the, this idea of being musical a couple of times. What yes. about for people who aren't like really people who consider themselves to be musical? Who who do not consider themselves to be musical? Yes. And I get this question all the time um, <laughs> because I love music so much and I tend to tout its powers. Um there are lots of ways to be musical with your child without actually singing to your baby. Um, Number one, we are most likely you're already doing it with your tiny baby. This something that we do all over the world in every single language, which uh, the technical term for it is infant directed speech, but many people know it as motherese or parentese, or even sometimes people refer to it as baby talk. But it's basically it's some very specific things that we do with our voices when we talk to babies. And I'm not talking about the, ah, oh, it's so cute. Get your little bottle waddle, right? Like that's just annoying, but <laughs> that's like an, a, a basic, um, that's like an exaggerated version of often what we're already doing. Right. So it's um, maybe exaggerated pitch contours, uh, slowing down of our voices using a higher pitch. Um, and, using fewer words and a slower rate and, and yeah, basically making our voices more musical. (laughs) So 
number one, you're already doing it. (laughs) And I like to say that really about all of these things. So many of the suggestions that I try to give to parents and caregivers are, are like, here's the name for the thing that you're already doing. And you can feel really good about the fact that you are already winning at parenting today. (laughs) Because we get so bombarded with all of the things that we're not doing yet, and we feel guilty about. So number one, that's a very important piece of it, right? You are doing so much already by just sitting there with your baby or having somebody else sit there with your baby. Um, And okay, so let's see, I've totally lost my train of thought. This is the problem with having two young children. (laughs) Well, I love that. (laughs) Yeah, happens to me all the time. Where was I? Yeah. I really needed to make that point. Well, no, you're right on. I mean, the whole point about being musical and, and yeah. speaking to your baby, but so it's not the the baby talk. Right. It's that, it's, it's those it's... sort of patterns in our voice, in our pitch, in our, in our speech patterns, the, you know, the slowing down, the making slightly more exaggerated contouring, the melody of our, of our language and of our speech patterns. Right. I mean, imagine what you're doing, right? You're, oh, hi, baby. Wow, look at you. What are you doing? Here I go. Up, up, up. We're going to do it. We're going to lift you up, right? Oftentimes you're repeating words, all kinds of things that you're doing. We do this innately, really. Um, And it's been shown that at least many of them are things that we all do in every single language, like I said, including sign language, which is fascinating right? A gestural language. There is also infant directed uh, sign language. When a person who uses, say, ASL is signing to their baby, they slow it down. They exaggerate the movements. Like, this is, this is humanity. (laughs) This is being human, right? You are teaching your baby to be human. This is the, the job of a parent. (laughs) But, um, but yeah, so there you're already probably doing those kinds of things. And if you can capitalize on that even more so, then great. But being musical is about the rhythm, um, the the pitch and the melody and the beat. So and and movement, right? I mean, you can you can listen to a song on the radio or on you know your computer and and you can move along to it. You can have a little dance party. You can tap your baby's, you know, leg to the beat. You can, you know, you can play with the words. You can do finger plays and and rhythms. You can read nursery rhymes. All of those things are ways to be musical and engage in musical musical activities. So, I think You know, it's easy to say, oh, well, I'm just not musical, but you're, you are, and you can be musical with your baby in many, many different ways that don't include just singing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So many things there. (laughs) (laughs) Unpack Um, that. (laughs) Totally. Um, I love the baby sign language. I adopted maybe a dozen words or so. And my two-year-old continues to kind of use them interspersed with language, verbal yes. language. Yes. Um, and it's, it's really fascinating how she just in different scenarios will pick different modes of saying the same thing because she can do it both ways. And I agree. It's really fascinating. Um, so anyway, super cool. Do it if you can. Um, and, and to that, and to that too, because I think sometimes, um, so some parents are hesitant to introduce sign language because, oh, is that going to impede my child's speaking? And the research shows us again and again that no, that it, you are creating an opportunity to help your child communicate to you using symbolic language. And whether that is a word that they say or a word that they you say specifically using a very specific gesture, mm-hmm. That's a word. Oh, yeah. So that that is teaching your baby to communicate. It is speaking. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ex- exactly. It's not verbal speech, but it is it is language. Yes. Yeah. And it's tempting to want to invest in your child in a way that will 
how do I put this? Result in them being a high achiever, right? So, sure, you know, like um, I think it's tempting to think, oh, well, if I read certain books or do certain activities or do certain things, then my baby's going to speak sooner and speak clearer <laughs> and have a whole host of skills that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And I just want to debunk that a little bit with you. I, I'm sure you have an opinion. Um, and I'd also be curious if we could just like what you would say about separating this idea of investing in your child and it being okay if it doesn't have a direct impact in the speed of language or the speed of development, that actually mm. there's a positive impact, even if it's not, um, if it's not seen by the parent in a certain kind of way. Mm. Yeah. I think, you know, it's easy to get caught up in all of the wonderful things that you can, if you have the not, the financial resources, invest in for your child. Uh, And I think that does two things. Number one, it makes us think that we can somehow make our baby more likely to, you know, get into an Ivy League college or something. And then it also really becomes very divisive because it makes those of us who cannot afford to invest in those resources feel that our children are missing out somehow. And I think the thing to remember (laughs) is that the biggest impact you can have on your child's development really is giving your child opportunities to observe, imitate, and interact and listen to your language, right? We have this, there is the 30 million word gap which we understand as basically this is a gap between children who um, are often from various socioeconomic brackets and often, yeah, so it's often reflective of of socioeconomic bracket and also um, just of a parent's level of un- of understanding that what what kind of in the the number of and the quality of interactions that we can give our children, whether that is through you as the mom or another primary caregiver, whether it's you as dad or you as nanny or you as daycare worker, as long as that child is getting many, many high quality and by high quality, I mean direct and loving and um, interactive opportunities, that's what is going to make the difference. <laughs> and number one. And number two, there is a broad spectrum of typical development. And I think we get very caught up with comparison. It's so easy. And we do it naturally because they are a reflection of us. <laughs> our children, we see them as a reflection of our own parenting skills And when, uh, you know, my first son didn't crawl until he was 10, 10 and a half months. And I I was like, oh, God, is that okay? I mean, theoretically, I knew that that was totally within the scope of being normal. But of course, it's still very difficult to be like, well, his buddy Henry's been crawling since since he was six months old. Like, is he behind? No, he's just not working on motor development. So realizing that you can invest in your child in many ways and beautifully and be doing all the things for your kid and they might not be performing what you, how you think they should be performing based on a milestones checklist because they're working on and doing so many different things underneath the surface that we're not aware of. you know, this is why we see our children repeat and repeat and repeat maybe the same movement because they're working on an interesting movement pattern that's allowing them to put the pieces together to learn how to crawl or because they're mouth, you know, they're mouthing this thing again and again. And we're like, oh, we'll get that book out of your mouth. But no, they're, they're experiencing a texture in a way that they hadn't. And they are probably making all kinds of neural connections that we just can't see from the start to finish because we're not in their brain. <laughs> so I think, you know, there's so much to unpack in there because 
again, we have this sort of adult conception of what learning looks like. And it's, it's not, <laughs> it's not that. So mm-hmm. allowing that learning to just sort of happen and allowing yourself the freedom to just be with your child and, and just, you know, offer opportunities to engage with the world sensorially, right? Through touch, through movement, through, um, through, you know, orally, through taste, through smell, all of the, be aware of the kinds of sensations and sensory experiences that your child is, is experiencing on a day-to-day basis. And that's when you are providing a full and enriching experience, right? And you can do that with natural objects, leaves, flowers, right? Of course, we want to very, very, be very cognizant of what we're allowing our children to play with and that there are no choking opportunities. But if you are holding on to something and giving your child the opportunity to, you know, smell a lavender sachet or whatever, I mean, these these are great ways to, to give your child access to lots of different experiences that their brains are then making sense of all that input. And that's how we, we provide rich experiences for our children. Mm-hmm. Yes. I don't know. I hope that answered your question. It does. It to- <laughs> you absolutely covered it. Um, I think there are people who are very uh, um, attached to the whole milestones charts and you brought that up. Yeah. And so just for the record, since you are kind of in this area, <laughs> yeah. is it worth just talking about what the range is for sure. like, first word kind of stuff? Yeah, I think really briefly, and then I think it's important to know because these are, of course, these are averages and things. If you experience something that is way out of that range of typical, then yeah, you want to be aware of of where your child is is on that spectrum. So, generally, you know, these things start. We we look at um, leading up to a first word. We look at the. the start or emergence of cooing, which is um, with the vowel sounds, right? Those beautiful ah, ooh, ah, ooh, uh, sounds around three or four months. Uh, and then we like to see the emergence of babbling between around four to seven to nine months. And again, like you can hear, these are ranges because they're working on so many things. When you think about what happens between a newborn and a one-year-old, like, whoa, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's crazy. So, so what babbling is, is it's that addition of a consonant with a vowel. So, ba-ba-ba-ba-ba or abadadadada. So the, the repetitive, um, babbling is the first thing to emerge. And then you might hear that variation of different consonant and vowel sounds together that happens after. And then you start to hear, um, what we refer to as jargon, which is all of the things put together without the content, right? So you hear, right. With the, the melody of the language, but with no content, with no vocabulary. <laughs> and that happens um, oftentimes around after that's that's sort of the progress, right? And then we start to see gestures in there as well, and things like pointing and clapping and waving uh, and nodding or shaking the head. Uh, my thirteen month old is really into. And I don't know where he got it. I don't do this. Wagging his finger, shaking his finger. No, no, no. <laughs> I think, honestly, I think his four-year-old brother did it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll blame, I'll blame the kid. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, and then the emergence of that first word or first words around the age of 12 months, between like 12 to 15 months is honest or between the age of 10 to 15 months is all considered like pretty normal. Mm -hmm. Um, And then what we like to see is, you know, a sort of range of different kinds of vocabulary words. And of course, words, these do not need to be perfectly shaped adult pronunciation, right? This is like, we're talking like m for milk, but if m always happens when they're maybe they're also signing milk or they're pointing to the milk or they're pointing to your breast or they're whatever, you know, 
whether there's some other way that you can, you see that that is definitely what they are saying, like that's a word. Uh Um, And then what we like to see is sort of a good variation of different kinds of words. Often first words are nouns or greeting words, uh, sometimes, you know, descriptors on or off um, is a good example. Um, And then once a child has about the sort of magical number of 50 words is often when we see two words starting to be put together, which we like to see by around two years old, by two years old, really. And yeah, and then being able to also follow, say, two step directions. So, you know, go to the door and get the shoes or, um, you know, yeah, two, two separate things. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of what we look at in the first, say, two years. And then, and then of course it, it goes from there. (laughs) Great. If you had a couple of minutes to talk about multilingual or bilingual households and how some of the stuff we've talked about might be the same or different. I will say that basically, number one, raising a bilingual or multilingual child is wonderful and entirely possible. And children have the capacity for so much when it comes to that. And I think, you know, there's, there was a lot of damage done, you know, 30 to 40 years ago within that, the, the information that was coming out about raising a bilingual child. And it's silly. Now we look at it and we're like, well, gosh, how silly that we believed that, you know, like anything. <laughs> Looking back, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? But, um, but yeah, I mean, basically there are two models that we sort of try to follow when it comes to multilingual or bilingual development. And of course these things don't, you know, language development doesn't happen in a vacuum. So it's not always possible to, you know, remain or adhere to this uh, strictly, but basically the one model is uh, simultaneous language development, which is essentially you have, you know, say, For instance, you have one parent who speaks Spanish and one parent who speaks Japanese. And and then you live in, say, sunny California. (laughs) So that means that your child theoretically will become trilingual, hopefully. Um, And you, you know, so one parent speaks only the one language and the other speaks only the other language. And then they start to hear the language of the community in addition to that. Now, what's most likely going to happen is that one or two of those, depending of course on how often and the kind of language experiences and interactions that each caregiver is engaging in with that child, um, those are things are of course going to affect that language development in each of those languages. Um, But yeah, that's certainly a wonderful way to do it. And then another model is what we refer to as sequential language development. So the language, say the home language is different from the community language. So for instance, you are a family who speaks German at home because that's the link, that's your home language and you live in Ohio. Um, Then your child is going to learn German at home, say for the first few years of life until he or she starts, you know, preschool. Uh, and that's, that's when they start to learn English for, if you're in America or in an in English speaking environment. Uh, so either of those models are wonderful ways to go about introducing multi, uh, bilingual language development. Uh, and then of course we tend to do something in between. So I think the the best advice or suggestion that I could give is number one, try to be as consistent as possible with the language that you're using or say the environment within which you're using that language. So if you speak multiple language with your ch- languages with your child, maybe, you know, during a specific caregiving routine, you only speak Spanish or 
and then everywhere else you speak English or something like that, where you, you have a very specific way of presenting each language. Um, and then the next thing is if you are, um, you know, speak, speak the language that you are in which you are most comfortable. So if, you know, for instance, if English is not your first language, that's okay. Speak the language that you are, are, were raised in. If you, if that is more comfortable for you, because you are providing a grammatically correct and full language model for your child. And that goes whether your whether or not your child is developing typically or atypically language wise. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Okay. So I understand that you have a website, a podcast, and then you also have a free weekly email resource. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, I'd love that. So I have developed what I call Strength in Words Weekly, which is um, sort of a weekly email series that is palatable and actionable, you know, developmental information and ideas that come straight to your inbox each week. And it sort of outlines really simple music and early literacy and sensory experiences and, um, and brings in, you know, ideas from the Strength in Words community, other parents and caregivers who have suggestions and ideas for the ways that you can, you know, say, get a little bit more pinpointed ideas for how you can enact that in your own home. Um, and, and also a curated collection of my own favorite developmental resources. And I have that. So you sign up and then you tell me whether you're expecting or you have an infant or toddler of a certain age or multiple young children. And then you get to sit back and receive ideas for developmentally appropriate and super supportive simple activities that you can do without having to buy anything (laughs) or set up really anything. So this is great for parents and caregivers who are, you know, desperate for something great to do when you're sitting there staring at your two month old and you're like, I have no idea what to do with you. (laughs) Um, And it's also great for a working parent who has, you know, 15 minutes between the time when you get home and you have to start you know, putting dinner on the table and you just want some, some time to connect with your baby or your toddler. So yeah, that's why I created that because we all need that kind of support. (laughs) Yes, we do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, thank you so much, Ayala, for being on our program today. Thanks so much, Sarah. It's been great to be here. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you again. And we'll see you next time on the fourth trimester podcast. Please do go to the fourth trimester podcast.com site and sign up for our newsletter. So you can hear more from us, find out when we have new show releases, get our transcripts, get the inside scoop. Often we write up content that is not covered on the show on our site and that's shared in our newsletter as well. So thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you next time on the fourth trimester podcast. You can subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone. And I hope you'll join us next time on the fourth trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband, Ben, daughter, Penelope, and baby girl, Evelyn. Don't forget to share the fourth trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Goodbye for now. song simple and true I wrote the song I'll sing a song for you you got your wheels you got your gears you ride around town without any fear you got your pedals you got your brakes You always wear your helmet for safety's sake